me. But thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be the first speaker here in this new series. And also to be in this room with all these great history books that's be behind me. I was looking earlier and there's things on the wires and the files and everything. So this is really a, you know, a great venue to do this talk. Uh, I think I've been to the Canon Library a number of times before and talked about some of these books. I know Jill and the Johnson Gang and the Richie Ashburn book. I remember being up and talking with a young gentleman who was a really big Phillies fan. So uh, it's great to be back. Today, I'm going to talk about my new book, Lafayette at Brandywine, The Making of an American Hero, which was just, I got my copies about two weeks ago. And actually, I think today is the official release date by the publisher. So this is a very much a brand new book. And I don't think a lot of people really know or realize today what a great hero Lafayette was, and especially around here, he really started to become a hero just down the road during the Battle of the Brandywine. And of course, we're uh, here in the area where the British launched that attack that morning on September the 11th, 1777, date of the Battle of the Brandywine. I thought what I first do is just kind of tell you a little bit about that morning, and then I'm going to go back and talk about Lafayette and his life and how he became the American hero. But on that morning of September 11th, Lafayette was pretty much an unknown in the Army. Uh, he was on Washington staff, one of many, many political European generals had come through Washington staff. The, Rank and file soldiers didn't really know who he was. He'd only been with Washington's army a few months. He was not in charge of any command. Matter of fact, before this battle, he was never in a, a battle in his life, even though he was a French military officer. Um, the other generals weren't real happy with him because uh, in August, the Continental Congress gave him this high rank, which meant he outranked them and they'd been fighting with Washington. So he wasn't really and well liked among the generals that, that knew him. And that's how the morning of September 11th started. Lafayette pretty much an unknown. But by the time the day ended, and actually that afternoon ended, he was well on his way to becoming an American hero. And it was all here. You know, why is that important to us? If you really look at the American Revolution, we wouldn't have won our freedom then. We probably would at some other point, but in the American Revolution, without the aid of France, we were having tough troubles staying with the British Army and especially the British Navy. We needed an ally. France was definitely that ally. You know, their, their military might, especially their Navy, really neutralize the British. And frankly, that relationship was a little rocky at times, especially early on. And George Washington called on his trusted aid many, many times to keep that relationship going. And that aid was Lafayette. So we, you know, there was a whole lot of things going on and why Lafayette was very important in our, uh, in our history. But let's go back to when he was born. Actually, we'll go forward five years. His father was a military man. He fought, he was an officer in the French army. And when Lafayette was five, his father was killed in the Seven Years' of War fighting the British Army. Something later happened when Lafayette was in Virginia, when he was in charge of some troops and they were trying to corner Cornwallis at Yorktown. There was a British officer there, was actually the head of the artillery division that was responsible for his father's death. And he so wanted to have an engagement with that officer and kind of avenge his father. Uh, that didn't quite happen. The officer actually died right before that battle would have taken place. But you know that kind of got Lafayette started. His whole military ancestors, they had won a lot of awards. They, they were nobility in France. They, they were worth a lot of money. When his father died, of course, he was brought up by his mother, actually his grandmother, a lot, and he had a niece that was in uh, the family home. 
Um, he stayed in the family estate for a while before going to Paris with his mother, who also died at a pretty young age. She was in her early 30s. Nat left young Lafayette, a very, very wealthy man, one of the wealthiest ones in France. Um, he was a musketeer. He, in his teens, of course, he was a very eligible bachelor. And in those days, of course, they had the arranged marriages. And his future father-in-law said, he'd be a good selection for one of my daughters. And that's what happened. It was an arranged marriage. They didn't tell his uh, wife anything about it for a while. Um, you know, she was engaged and had no idea about it. Her mother was a little bit uneasy with Lafayette because he was so young. They were both so young. How old would they have been? I think it was like 15 and 12. I mean, they, they were young. They were very young. They were, they were in that, when the arranged marriage took place. Father-in-law got Lafayette into um, the French army got him a, a, a commission, everything seemed to be going along. The, the marriage actually took place. They had a young daughter when, when Lafayette was still 19 years old. The wife was about 15, 16, that area. And during one of the postings, Lafayette met some um, military people and also the, uh, brother of the king of England, because at that point, France was not fighting England and the, the son or the brother was touring France. And Lafayette heard about the, the fight for American freedom, American independence. And he said, you know, I'd really like to take part. It, it really resonated with him. And he kind of made up his mind. He was going to help us out. He went to Silas Dean, who was uh, our representative <coughs> in France and Dean was trying to get all the support he could from France and he was having a little trouble. Part of it was France had just been defeated by Great Britain. So they were really, really in a position to aid the United States. They didn't want to get into another war. They wanted us to get our freedom and beat up on Great Britain. They figured they could get back some of their possessions that they had lost from the French and Indian War. So they were kind of on the sidelines cheering us on. There were some attempts to get us some military aid. Dean said, immediately said, yes, we'd love to have you as an officer in our army. He gave him a commission to be presented in Philadelphia and sent him away. The problem was Dean was giving everybody a commission and Washington was really getting sick of all these political generals coming over that really didn't help us. They, they were taking up space, they were wasting money, they, they knew little over a language, they couldn't raise troops. So Washington was pretty much ready to say, no more, don't want any of them. But Lafayette didn't knew, know that. So he decided to get a couple of his fellow musketeers and some other officers that Dean had recruited and come to the United States to, to fight on our side. One of the, the recruited musketeers had a little bit of a you know, second thoughts and kind of contacted and they got back to the king and Lafayette's father-in-law. And they said, uh, nope, can't have you over there. We can't have such a visible, visible nobleman out there fighting for the US who would drag us into the war with, with England. So they, they decided to stop Lafayette from going. Easier said than done. Lafayette had a little second thoughts, but he eventually bought his own ship. Like I said, he really was, was rich at that point. He gets everybody together. The king is sending out a posse, basically, some of his guards, to arrest Lafayette and make sure he doesn't leave for America. And there's a great escape attempt as he goes uh, and, and makes his way. And he finally, you know, just barely gets away from the, the king's men and sails to the United States. What he didn't do was he didn't tell his wife he was leaving. And she was pregnant. They already have one kid, and he is on the ship coming over to the United States. 
he, uh, he had second thoughts about a lot of things. And you could tell in a letter he wrote back to his wife uh, that uh, during this trip. And when I, a lot of my research came from Lafayette's own memoirs and his family right after his death added some things and they're available. And I had great access to that. And I had access to the American Friends of Lafayette and their scholars and some other works. I talked with other authors and some of the research, especially on the granny line from around here and local sources. So that's where the information came from. And if you, Lafayette's life is just so big and vast and so many things. If you were going to do an autobiography, it would probably be 4,000 pages long if you try to do everything. My book, it really deals with what he did here in the United States and his impact, but also enough to tell you how he started his life and what happened in France and the French Revolution and everything. So I concentrated mainly with what happened here in the United States. If you read a lot of the, the others, there are certain letters and passages and quotes that are um, quoted a lot and they're quoted verbatim in a language that always stops me from reading it. And I think a lot of other people. So what I did was truncated it, try to, and to keep it exactly with the meaning, but also have the footnotes. If you want to go back and read it, there's where you find it. But this one letter he wrote back to his wife, um, I just thought it was so poignant and really told a lot about it. Because he, you could tell all through his life, he was really wanted people to be free and, and treated right. It didn't matter if you're man, woman, slave, free, whatever. He was against slavery his whole life. That's you know, what he was. But this letter goes on for a couple of pages. And what, what he talks about, trying to explain to his wife why he came over and pretty much was saying, I hope you still love me. <laughs> you know, I'll be back. Uh, you do love me, don't you? And it goes back and forth like that for, for a number of pages. But it's really kind of telling that, that he wanted his uh, marriage to succeed and everything. So, and it, and it did. They were, they were a loving couple. Um, during the French Revolution, she was actually in prison and almost sent to the guillotine. Some of her family members were. And Lafayette was imprisoned also. And she spent some time after she was released in prison with him until he was released. And there was an interesting guy that helped him get out. Uh, his name was Napoleon. <laughs> he, uh, uh, Lafayette was not a fan of Napoleon, but when Napoleon needed Lafayette's sort of charisma to help him keep power, so we have to to free Lafayette, but that's kind of later in the life. Lafayette makes it to South Carolina, hooks up with some uh, local militia, an officer befriended, writes another letter back to his wife saying what a grand place the United States, he loves it on first sight. He's sending a series of letters and he never gets anything back because who knows when she got them, where is he in the United States? How do you get the letters there? And of course, it's got to go by ship. So there was little communication. He was pretty much in the dark. So he didn't know if his wife was going to welcome him back with open arms or if the king was and then throw him in the dungeon for you know, years and years for violating the orders of the king. So he had all that going on. He gets to the United States. He buys several carriages in South Carolina and starts on his way to Philadelphia. Those carriages lasted maybe a week. You know, the roads through the backwoods are not quite the same as the roads in France. He has to buy horses, and it's a pretty you know, awful trip to start off. But he makes it to Philadelphia the end of July of uh, 1777, and he goes and knocks on you know, the door of the Continental Congress, Independence Hall, and he says, here I am. Here's my papers from Silas Dean, um, your new general. And the response from the Continental Congress was, go home, little boy, go home. Mm -hmm. We don't want you. And that was because of an order that Washington gave the Continental Congress. Again, he didn't like the European generals, and he said no more. 
not unless I say yes, and he didn't give us approval to Lafayette. Uh, there was another officer, a guy named Baron DeKalb. And if you go towards King of Prussia, you'll get on DeKalb Pike, and that's, that's the DeKalb it is. He was very instrumental. He actually lost his life later fighting for our freedom. And he was ready to go home. He was just going to turn around and leave. Lafayette persuading him to hang around a little bit. Lafayette wanted to become part of our in fight for independence. And indeed, he got a little help from some of his friends, including Benjamin Franklin, wrote to Congress and said, we need France. Here's a guy who's well thought of in France and he's rich. Now that's, you know, he can bring us money, even you know, contacts. So they kind of talked with Washington and it's a little, if he, Washington was under the impression, you know, give him his commission, but make it an honorary one. Pretty much stand over there, a little boy, and say, over away. You can play general if you want. Lafayette said, uh uh, I'm commanding troops. That's what I came through, and I'm going to fight. And at one point, Washington wrote back to the Continental Congress and said, What am I going to do with it? And the Continental Congress pretty much said, That's your problem. You know, he's on your staff now. So Washington kind of adopted and put him on his staff. Um, there's a lot of talk that the relationship built up that Washington is almost like a father figure to Lafayette and Lafayette was a, a son figure. And, and I can see that, and that there's a great closeness that's developed over the years. So I can see how that was a problem, probably the way it was. Matter of fact, when uh, Lafayette's son was born, they named him George Washington Lafayette. So you know that you know, was pretty much a close relationship. Um, he's on staff, it's now August, we're two months away from the Battle of Brandywine. Uh, again, he has no military experience, he's expecting the troops going around doing a reconnoitering process with Washington before the Battle of Brandywine. He's with Washington and said, well, you know, we, we need a defensive position to defend Philadelphia. Not that Washington wanted to do this. He knew it was crazy to take the British Army on head on, but the countries in Europe that might support us were, they didn't want to see us running away from the British and just handing the, the capital over. And politicians were clamoring, you know, defend us. So he was pretty much, he said, you know, we got to do this. And he picked the brand new one. Um, down at Chad's Ford, the brandy one was a lot deeper than what it was today, except when it rains here. <laughs> and it's probably about the same. Um, they said it was up over a man's waist, which you know you can get through, but it's not like it's a little brook and you can walk across. Uh, Washington said, we're gonna put our defense here and we want how to drive his army and try to drive us off the banks and our defensive positions. Sounds pretty good idea he used and when i did my research on, on the battle of the brandywine book um there was always talk of a group of locals that told washington if you just protect the fords basically down to where lenape is they won't get around you you know they have to go to days to get around you so we that's pretty much where he put sullivan down on the right flank the problem was that wasn't true. And I can't find out who was at that meeting or even if that meeting took place. It was also come to light that before Washington picked this defensive position, uh, his cartographer, very much an amateur in the army, did a rough draft of the Brandywine and the Fords, and he only put in three. So, he, you know, this was not a detailed one. So he might have very well used that for the basis of his defense. He didn't really scout it himself or didn't send Sullivan's scouts out before the battle took place. He was only there, you know, less than 48 hours before the battle took place. So you had that set up. Hal gets here. Hal had a lot of Tory support, including a guy who uh, lived in outside of Downingtown in East Carolina Township, who knew, supposedly knew the land like the back of his hand. And he was able to lead the half of the army with Cornwallis and how on a flanking maneuver to get in back of Washington that day. 
Washington knew he, he could be outflanked. He got beat a year before Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn, you know, New York. That's it's been called all three of them with the flanking movement. And all morning he was really uneasy about it. You know, he, he was talking to members of staff. Can't somebody tell me where they are? Because he thought they were out there, they weren't out there, they were flanking. Um, and one of his aides, guy you might have heard of, Hamilton, was very much you know, involved in this process, as was Lafayette was there taking orders and rode with Washington that morning. He was, you know, back to the John Chad's house, he was all over there. Uh, and the agitation kind of kept coming and coming. Finally, the word came in, the British indeed had outflanked them about a 14 mile plus more march around. They were up on Osborne Hill. If you know Radley Run Country Club, that's kind of the ridge right across from it. And Washington's army was again about ready to be defeated. A couple of the British army officers wrote in their diaries and they said if they had another hour of daylight, no George Washington army would have been left that day. And you know, the deal was that the flanking uh, with Hal and Cornwallis will come this way. The other half of the army, which is in front of uh, the Brandywine under the Hessian Knifehausen, when he heard the attack, he was supposed to come across and would just get him in the middle. Came close. At the height of this, when they knew they were being outflanked, our friend Lafayette, who again had no command, no experience, went up to Washington and said, I want to join him. I want to come up and help. And Washington at this point just needed whatever help he could get and said, go ahead. So Lafayette and several of his aides, according to a guy, Jimet, G-I-M-A-T, who was on his staff, rode up. They got in back of Birmingham Hill. Um, General Conway, his troops were in front of him. And he went to join and help them. We know pretty much where he was fighting that afternoon because the, the placement of Conway's troops. And if you go up to the Birmingham Meeting House and across the Birmingham Road, there is the new preserve of the Brandywine Conservancy. That's pretty much where Conway's troops were. So we think he pretty much was wounded in that area that was just preserved. He gets down, he gets off his horse, and he's not like the other generals that kind of stand him back. He got down, he was trying to rally his troops, he was doing whatever he could. The British is coming on, they're getting within, you know, yards of him, and Lafayette is shot through the left calf. Bullet goes clean through, which was good. His boot starts filling up with blood. Jamet sees what was going on, and he says, let's get you out of here. They put him on his horse and take him to the wood line, which I take is the woods behind Wiley Road there. He gets his first treatment, and he heads to, they get him off on the path of the retreat that ends up in Chester that evening. Uh, the last two talks I've given, I've gotten a, a question saying, well, didn't he go back to Lafayette's headquarters and get treated under the big sycamore tree? <laughs> that didn't happen. That's one of the myths. You know, you wouldn't go back towards the British army to get treated. He was right back to Chester. Luckily, some of the other Virginian troops, they, they held off the, the British for a pretty good period of time there. And they went towards and retreated towards Chester. Lafayette is holding his own, trying to keep the retreat orderly. Um, a little bit later, they took him into this house, put him on a kitchen table to get more medical treatment. When some of the officers he knew came in, his quip was, these guys haven't eaten in a while. I hope they don't think I'm dinner, <laughs> as he laid on the kitchen table. That's out of his <laughs> memoir. He gets the treatment. The next day, he's taken to Philadelphia again. The British are about ready to come in, which they did a few days later, take over Philadelphia. He's taken up to uh, Bethlehem to get treated. The future president of the Continental Congress actually gave him the ride up. Lafayette is very good at making connections. He's very personable. And he does this all through, all through his life. He gets there, you know, he talks a lot about what took place. It was very crowded up there. Um, and he finally recovers enough 
come back to Washington's army. He gets to Washington's army before they actually encamp at Valley Forge. And he joins and he has his first military skirmish, which he does okay. Some people said he was very lucky to escape because he disobeyed really an order or a suggestion by General Washington. But he did make a daring type of escape. He didn't really lose any, any of his men and everything worked out fine. And then they went into Valley Forge. And they stayed there, of course, this uh, tough winter. And Washington was now gaining in stature, so was Lafayette. But Washington had a lot of people who didn't really, really want him in command. Uh, general Gates, especially, wanted to be the general. And actually, before Lafayette came over, a couple of the, his uh, French Officer said, we really think a Frenchman ought to be in charge of the American army, more experienced. So there's a lot of intrigue with Washington, but Lafayette was very staunch supporter of George Washington. There was at that point Gates and Conway, the, the general he fought with, the brainy one, they got what they was called the war board, which gave them control of military office. Uh, operations uh, that the Continental Congress kind of gave them authority, and they wanted to discredit Lafayette because that would discredit Washington. So they had this grand idea for a operation that winter, and they thought, you know, the French wanted to get back Canada. Lafayette's French. Why don't we send him with and to attack Canada? Think about that. You want to attack Montreal? in January, not a good idea. And Washington saw for it, Lafayette saw for it. Lafayette alerted the friends in Congress. He wrote back to his father-in-law, at least they were uh, communicating at that point, and let the king know it's not my idea, this is a bad idea. Uh, he went to York where the Continental Congress was. He received his orders. Washington says, told him you can't, you know, you can't disobey him. Um, eventually made his way to New York, you know, the state, and the promised men weren't there, the promised money wasn't there, and everybody that was there said, you are nuts, there's no way anybody's going to take Montreal at this time of the year. Eventually, they got the war, war, war board to back around, and Lafayette returns to Valley Forge. Washington keeps giving a little bit more power, a little bit more command. He takes place, uh, takes part in the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, one of Washington's victories, and keeps gaining in stature as the year goes on. When the fighting ends that year, he goes back to France. Of course, not knowing what his wife thinks of him, and also what the king's going to do to him, but he had gained such trust and admiration here, he was welcomed pretty much as a hero. Wife took him back with open arms, and the king had to punish him though. So he gave him the severe punishment of home confinement for about a week <laughs> in his pouch, you know, this great big home he has. And that, that was his punishment for disobeying the king's order. Um, while he was there, he, he talked with people, he talked with the king. He said, we got to you know, support America. They can beat him, but they need our help. And he, he was just all over the place. And he was getting grand schemes to attack Britain. Um, you know, he, he was a great supporter. Finally, as the next year began, France decided to support us. The king told Lafayette, you go back, help out. You take the news that we're now officially their allies and start gathering ships and men to help us and, and more supplies. And that was quite an honor when uh, he, before he departed to come back to the United States, he showed up before the king dressed in a military uniform of the United States. It was a clear message to the king. You know, I'm fighting with George Washington. I'm not a member of you know, the French army, which was fine. And later on, they found out because the first year was a little rocky and they had some problems with the chain of command that uh, when it came back later that they made sure that the French general was fighting under Washington's orders. They were in charge of the French army, but Washington was an overall 
command. He gets back to America, tells Washington there, there's, you know, of course, great celebration in the camp. We now have an ally we can count on with some power. And uh, Washington pretty soon went up to New England to talk with the French allies. Uh, he went past a little place called West Point, uh, stopped in to see the commander, a guy named Benedict Arnold. He said, we'll talk more on the way back. Of course, when he came back, Washington was there and Hamilton was there with, with Washington, the discovery of Arnold's treachery that he was going to give West Point to the British. Arnold just escapes in time, becomes a British officer, is sent to Virginia to help out with the British forces there. Washington's livid, Hamilton's livid, Lafayette's livid, and they all write about it, what they think. And finally, Washington needed some help down in the South because some of the battles in Charleston were not going well in Savannah. And he said, I'm gonna send Lafayette down with a small contingent, like a little over a thousand men to help out. And he wanted Anthony Wayne, the general from just down the road here, to gather more men and help Lafayette. Problem was they were both having trouble recruiting anybody. They weren't paying much. And some of the other units were paying more and it took Wayne a long time to get down there. It was other obstacles on the way, but it ended up Lafayette was in Virginia with an inferior force. And you got Cornwallis out there ready to, you know, tear them apart if they came into combat, you know, in the field right, opposing each other. So Lafayette kept, wouldn't allow it to have him, kept fighting at the edges. Cornwallis is trying to capture Jefferson and Monticello. Jefferson just barely escapes. And as he's doing all this, Cornwallis is doing all this, he's losing men's supplies and his supply base is back in London. Or if he can get some help from New York, but the general there, Clinton, was not about to really give any of his men out to Cornwallis because he was afraid Washington was going to attack New York City, exactly what Washington wanted to do the whole war. So Cornwallis said, maybe I ought to be evacuated back to New York. I'll go back to you know, the Yorktown area and the British Army and Navy can just pick me up and take us back. And that's pretty much what they had. And Lafayette all the time saying, get the French fleet here, we can capture them, we can break the, you know, the British army, get down here as soon as you can. Washington already had that idea. The British fleet under the Admiral de Grassi out of the West Indies came up. The um, route Rochambeau and Washington got the armies down. And indeed, Lafayette was told just don't allow Cornwallis to escape. He didn't. And he had the big confrontation and siege at Yorktown and in October, on October 19th, 1781, the, uh, the surrender took place. That pretty much ended the big military engagements in this war. It took a couple more years to get the peace treaty signed, but that was major. And a lot of it was due for Lafayette bottling in Cornwallis, keeping him there, and helping to take part in, in the final battle that led to the surrender. Big time, big you know, hero, everybody knew that. He returns to France again. He, you know, he's a hero, he's a hero's welcome. He helps back there with the finalization of the Treaty of Paris. Everything looks great. And we have the French Revolution. French Re Revolution takes place. Lafayette is true to his word. You know, he wants individual freedom for all. He advocates for that, which put him in a bad position. Because if you're telling the king, give up your power, the king said, no way, I'm not doing that. And you had the, you know, the general populace looking at Lafayette saying, can we trust him? He's a royal himself. So he's kind of caught in the middle and he spent years just kind of right and you know, walking at tightrope and as you as we all know it became very violent i didn't write much about the uh, 
French Revolution just a little bit that the locket was him because that is such a big historical you know event and there's a lot to it so I looked at that for other people but you know basically Lockett caught the middle he fell out of this favor he lost even more of his fortune um, I said he, he was very much against slavery the whole his whole life and he a lot of times he hammered with Jefferson and Washington give up your slaves, give up your slaves. And they basically said, yeah, it's a good idea, but we're not gonna do it. So it was really disappointing. He bought a plantation in the Indies and had some slaves and he didn't exactly say free, but what he did, he paid them, he gave them health care, he educated them. And the next step was to be able to free them. When he got in trouble, when Lafayette got trouble in France, he was at one point put in prison and more of his uh, wealth was taken away. Those plantations were confiscated and the, the workers were back being slaves, basically what happened, really disappointing, the whole thing. Um, like I said, he you know, was in prison in Austria for a couple of years and Napoleon helped him get out. His family was kind of destroyed the whole time. And we in the United States didn't do much to help him. And we didn't help him much because at that point, we weren't the strongest nation around. We were less than 50 years old. And France you know, had a couple of kings that weren't really sure about us. And we didn't want to get into a fighting war with them by going in and saying, you know, give us your present prisoner. You know, he helped us out. Um, the future president, Monroe, who met Lafayette during the American Revolution. They became pretty good friends and, and, and Monroe and his wife helped to get Lafayette's wife out of prison at one point, kind of saved it there. And Monroe knew we owed a debt to Lafayette. During the um, later years of, of Lafayette's life, and he was in and out of politics, he was elected and defeated and politicians in, in France in the second you know, French Revolution, all that's going on. But towards the end of his life, Monroe was saying, we need to do something. And Monroe was ending his term as US president at that time. And what he did, he talked the Congress into inviting Lafayette over. Her first was supposed to have been uh, about a four month tour of the United States, just to honor him and give him some of his due and some of his wealth back. Uh, the French king didn't really want him to go because they again were afraid that Lafayette was going to come over here and lead an invasion of France. So he got a hard time, but he did finally make it to the United States. And he got here in August of 1824. One of the reasons Monroe and everybody went him over here because in a couple of years, we're going to have the big celebration of the 50th anniversary of the United States. And they thought, bringing a Lafayette over would help reignite the idea of freedom of everybody around here in the, in the country. So he lands in New York City immediately, a big feast, parades, speeches, and this is day after day after day. A really good book that I use uh, was written by Lafayette's secretary who was with him during this whole trip. Um, the president of the American Friends of Lafayette, a guy named Alan Hoffman, translated from the French into the English. It's a really interesting reading. And I used that for the basis of the back part of my book on this trip. And I also had Alan edit the book and make sure I didn't goof up too much on the facts. So, so he was really good. American Friends did a lot to help with the book. So Lafayette gets here and it's just one day after the other, he goes to New England and stops at a lot of places, come back, he goes to Philadelphia. You know, he finally ends up towards the end of the year in DC and talks with some of the politicians, presidents and everybody there. And he's ready to go back. And his time's up. And he was told, you can't go. Every other state wanted him to visit. They wanted to pay their respects to him. And that's what happened. He was actually here 13 months. Can you imagine anybody today or in any other part 
that would be seated and honored for 13 straight months in every county visitor. You know, I, I can't. And then, you know, it was you know, kind of the same, all these events and back and forth. But the one, one of that, that the secretary said that Lafayette really touched me was the same incident that um, I was actually in Yorktown for the recent anniversary events. And we were talking after one of my talks and, and somebody asked me, what did you most impacted you about Lafayette and research? And it, it was this incident that, that's really described. After you know all of this formal things going on and events and homage, uh, there was an impromptu stop one afternoon outside of Norfolk, Virginia. And it wasn't planned, and he was buying the inn, and the innkeeper wrote on the wall in charcoal, welcome Lafayette. Lafayette came in for something, and the innkeeper said, Do you have time to meet my son and my wife? Lafayette says, Of course. And what a really just poignant moment. The young son put his hand on Lafayette and said, I just want to thank you. Thank you for getting the freedom for me and my family. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, that, that kind of encapsulates why he became an American hero. He continues and he goes down south, he comes up. And the biggest piece of uh, excitement was on the Ohio River. And his son, George Washington Lafayette, was there with him. And he's on a boat. And his son says, this pilot's taking it a little bit too fast for the night and it's fog and everything. And sure enough, he hits a snag and the boat sinks with Lafayette on it. And went to rock, rescue Lafayette, you know, most got him off the ship. He says, I need to go back. Everybody gave me such great mementos from my trip, I gotta save them. Well, the son says, I'll get him, get him off here. And Lafayette made it to shore. And for a while, he thought his son was lost. It was very chaotic and hectic. But eventually, they found the son. I think actually the secretary, he went back and found George Washington <laughs> Lafayette, brought him back. No lives lost, but a, a really interesting experience, you can imagine. He, went back, completed his tour in July, the end of July of 1825, he was actually at back at Chad's Fort during part of this trip. Started the night before, he was in Chester, came to Chad's Ford, a lot again ceremonies. He was telling people where they crossed. He went to see Gilpin, who he knew the family from the Battle of the Brandywine days. And then later on, he went into Westchester for a big celebration that night. They, they know from press reports what streets he went through. There's a monument in Westchester where Lafayette stood, where he was addressed. Um, the person who made the invocation that night was a Reverend Lotta. And if you know the A. Dewey Pile Company, that's, a, that's an ancestor of the family who runs it. Pretty interesting. So he did that, he finishes, he goes to Lancaster the next day, finishes the tour, big send off, going back to France after 13 months here. And the ship he was boarded was a new one. And it was named Brandywine mm -hmm. after this, after the battle here. And that took him back to France. He um, stayed in politics a little bit. He, uh, and he was in his 60s, mid 60s, when he was here for the trip. He died in his, I think it was early 70s. And he caught COVID at a funeral. He didn't wear a hat and it was raining and was very in Paris. There's a lot of people, who, and, and he's been called the hero of two worlds, France and the United States. Yeah, he's a hero here, I think, you know, no question about it. In France, that's a little iffy because what he did during the French Revolution, there was not quite uh, recognized as a hero. And, and if you go to France, I'm told today, you'll, you'll get varying opinions on him. There was a lot of people did turn out to for his funeral and he's buried in Paris today. Um, 
Yeah, that's kind of, you know, just the overall basic story. There's a lot more to it. I've been asked, well, why did you write the book? There's books on Lafayette. There's a lot of books on Lafayette, but not with this area. And since I had done the Battle of the Brady one, you know, why did I do the, you know, kind of the second one? And I just want to kind of leave you how I got to do this book. When I was writing the, the first book, September 11th book, you know, it was a major defeat for, for us here. I think it's pretty much you know, obvious from the, what happened, the defeat and the casualties and everything. But I was looking and I, and I asked people around here, what, there must have been something good that happened to George Washington's army. And I was told that, well, you know, late in that afternoon, our troops fought the vaunted British army two hours, just kind of almost to a dead standoff. And they took that thought back to Valley Forge and it made them better soldiers. And they defeated the British. And when I first said, mm, you know, that's what they said. So I actually reported it. But that really kind of gnawed at me for a long, long time. I said, is that true? I said, well, you know, it was three months after the Battle of Brandywine that they even went to Valley Forge. And it was another two or three months before they even started to drill. Do you really remember a defeat like this, those couple hours? Why wouldn't you remember the victory at Saratoga? Or if you remember a defeat, you know, you have Paoli, the Paoli massacre, remember Paoli, the battle cry. When you remember that, um, and I think uh, von Steuben, the drill master of Valley Forge, probably had a lot more to do with making the troops better than what they remembered two hours at, at Brandywine. So um, Kim, this is really iffy, but what else, you know, was important at Brandywine? And Lafayette just kept on coming back to my mind. I started talking to some of the Lafayette scholars and when I found out that, you know, he was almost told, he was told to go home and almost did even before he got started and what he meant later to the United States, I said, you know, Lafayette really makes Brandywine important because this is really where the American heroes started. So that's why I went back to kind of do this book. Uh, Brandywine's gotten lost in history a lot. If you, you look at a lot of the TV shows and other things written, Brandywine's not mentioned much. And I think I, I discovered it with my first book. I spent five or six years researching and writing and working with a publisher to get it out. And I had two weeks in London, and I went to the public records office, which is like their national archives in the British Army Museum. And when I went to the, the public records office, I said, I'm here to study the American Revolution. And they said, yes, yes, we've heard of that in that, in that tone. <laughs> but when I mentioned Brandywine, I said, no, here was one of their major victories. I didn't know anything about it. Well, if you kind of look in the bookstores and talk with them, American Revolution is like a blip on the history. They don't deal with this much at all. You know, they lost the war, so they don't talk even about the victories. But we won the war. Why don't we talk about Brandywine? Well, it was not Washington's favorite battle. He got beat here like he did in Long Island, so he never talked about it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's everything's just been kind of lost or covered up or, you know, just kind of foggy. But I really think because it really started Lafayette on the road to being an American hero that it really should be gain a lot more importance. And that's my shorthand version of Lafayette, the American mm -hmm. hero. Uh, questions from, yeah. Well, I have one. Um, so um, through the French Revolution, right. how is it that he survived, um, he and his wife? And then also what was the um, like outcome of all of his wealth and holdings through that. So when he died, what did, he, obviously he was not executed, right? Um, but so what happened to, or was it supplemented by that point by American? Good, good question. What, basically what happened to Lafayette once he went back to France and the French Revolution. If you read the accounts of the revolution, and it's really amazing that he did survive because there was times that the you know, people in power and that shifted a number of times. 
told Lafayette to go do something he didn't want to do, including putting the, you know, the king and Marie Antoinette in irons and escorting them different places. And, you know, he was doing things he didn't really want to and at times just kind of refused. And that's uh, when he was put in, in the prison, he was leading sort of the civilian guard against the monarchies okay. fighting and, um, it wasn't going well and he knew he was about ready to go in prison so he tried to escape and he was arrested on the Austrian border and um, they were supporting the king of France the monarchy and that's why he went into it. He spent a lot of his money here because if you look at the various times that you know he would feed and clothe his troops you know time and time again um, you know he didn't get a pay uh, he, he was, when he was imprisoned, he, he lost even more of his fortune. He was, he was never really destitute, but, you know, the, the wealth went way down, down, down. After he got out of prison, started coming up a little bit. Uh, the U.S. wanted to give him land here, and I think that was part of the payoff and money. So he, he was getting the wealth up, and he did that. Uh, his wife, along with Lafayette's family, were nobility, wealthy, and that's why some of her family were actually you know, guillotined. And she was slated to be guillotined before the Monroes went in and helped to get her out. Uh, and it's just back and forth with that, that history. It's very intricate. Yeah. So the, what's the, um, the origin of, of the title Marquise and, and how did he get that? How did he get that? Uh, I'm not quite sure the, the <laughs> origin, but that's handed down like in England, like a Duke or uh, the Duke of York or the Duke or whatever. So it's a French title that kind of comes down through the family. Yeah. yeah. But then did he have a role in the Louisiana Purchase? Um, I don't think he did. Okay. I think at some point he was going to be given some land that was part of that, but it didn't quite work out, but I'm a little fuzzy on exactly the, the ins and outs of that. Two questions. Yeah. Um, first was, did Lafayette have any involvement with Pale Wood? There were no. some pretty ugly things going on there. There was. Now, he, uh, Brady Wine was September the 11th. By the 13th or 14th, he was in Bethlehem. And during the Paley, Asker, he was recuperating up in Bethlehem. He missed Paoli, he missed Germantown. He didn't get back to the army until late in November. Okay, yeah. and second question, if I can, I'm, I'm doing some, some research for a thesis and the period is a little bit earlier than, than we're talking about here, mm -hmm. uh, Cressup's War. And, and, and um, I find in terms of research, if you can give me some enlightenment, uh, a lot of the materials not digitized, very difficult to find, conflicting information, any pearls of wisdom or, or you any know, on miracles? The <laughs> I don't know about a miracle. I found the same, you know, issues with you. Um, and, and there's a lot of misinformation out there that digitifies. When I was doing the Battle of the Brandywine, uh, there's a library called the David Library. It's a private one at Washington's Crossing that actually helped me a little bit. You could go blind with the microfilm. Um, okay. the, I, I really don't like to do any research on the internet because there's too much bad stuff. But there's some well-known universities and things that, and even with Lafayette's memoirs, it's up there. And you got to watch, make sure you got the, the right version of them. But, uh, you know, there's times if you, you, and you can go to the National Archives and there's, you know, some of that stuff is digital. So but I, I found even, even in, in a COVID world, that there's another encumbrance there. I talked to the director of the University of Maryland, and oh, sure, we can do this, except now for COVID, we can't let we you can. in. Yeah, now it's, so it's, it's been maybe in a year. Yeah, you know, that kind of And, and you got to watch because you never know what's good and bad. When I was doing this book, uh, the Battle of Brain in my book, you know, one of the things I heard was that John Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice for Brain in my he was wounded there. I thought, Figure in American history. Let me let me look into this. And I saw his written record. What he said about Brandywine, and indeed he was here. I mean, 
didn't have many good things to say about his officers. They thought all the officers were pretty much competent. But never he said he was wounded. And I said, that's strange. And that was kind of written in stone at the, at the battlefield. And I went to Marshall Scholars and I checked with Marshall School of Law in Virginia. Nothing about being wounded. And I was at Chester County Historical Society. And I found the um, uh, something written by Lieutenant McMichael of his diary that's there. And it said, in the morning of September 11th, my Captain John Marshall was wounded. That's where it came from. And that still didn't make any sense. Why didn't he talk about it? And then the answer is, I went to Harrisburg, found the regiment records for McMichael, and there were two Captain John Marshalls on the same part of the field. The Pennsylvania John Marshall was wounded, not the Virginia John Marshall. And they were both part of Maxwell's light infantry, but easy to do. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you got to kind of. Um, when I was in Virginia, in your camp, went to a event the Friday, it was events Friday, a month, or what was it, Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, and the Sunday night, they had a local historian going up there and talking about that Lafayette and somebody else that he was wounded with and they recovered together. And I said, this doesn't sound right. And you, you know, bad thing to talk to some Lafayette groups <laughs> if you don't get that right. And I, I, in the next two days, three other people, it doesn't sound right. So when I got home, I did a little just easy research on it and I'm convinced that the second guy, somebody wrote something, just took Lafayette's wounding and kind of made the same wound on this other guy. And, you know, it, again, you just got to kind of watch it to track it through. Yeah, quick question, you, you touched on this. Um, his, well, I never knew that his father had been killed by the British. Right. Would it be safe to say that his motive, a lot of his motivation was that that point. It came, uh, the question is, does the motive come through from his father's death? I think I was with him and he mentioned this more than once in, in his memoir. His dad died in the Battle of Minden. I'm talking about, you know, I, I was doing some research and then wrote a little bit about it. And there was one source that said he was killed in the, the, ba the battle before the main battle, like two days before. And the other one saying he died in the main battle. And I'm saying, you know, how am I going to figure this out? And well, I reached out to American Friends of Lafayette, who had the pension records of Lafayette, or wow. Lafayette's mother, and in it, it listed the exact date of his death. So, um, yeah, again, you got to real, really kind of watch that. And, but, yeah, that, that was a motivation. Also, his family had a history of military men that they're winning honors on the field of battle. So. You know, he had all that to, he wanted, he, you know, he wanted to make a name for himself too, but that was part of it. He was not a shrinking violet, by him, but he was you know, kind of honest and, and again, you know, he just kind of liked everybody. Uh, just to kind of, if you could expound on that, what in your research, in your opinion, so, you know, so he's French nobility, I don't know where or how many generations or... Many generations in the family. Uh, Chopinot is north of Paris. I think it's, it's, I forget how many miles, but it's 100 so, miles so, or something. So, you know, generational, you know, serving the king, fighting mm -hmm. in wars, commanding, being right. handsomely rewarded yep. for this service. What, do, in your opinion, caused, um, contributed to him taking, which would have been then a pretty radical view of- And, and it was radical. You're yeah. absolutely right for the nobility of that time. Absolutely. A lot of people have said, and I kind of buy into it, uh, what I research I've done on his early life, he was really influenced by his grandmother. He was brought up a number of years by her and, and pretty much there was not a male figure in there. So I think some of that gave him that view of the world that, you yeah, know, we're all kind of equal, it doesn't matter what the sex is. Um, so I think that was a lot of it. And I really wish you know, I'd know more about that meeting where he met the, the brother of the King of England and was talking about this over here and the brother was not happy with his brother, the King, because the, 
taking one around the fight because of some other you know, personal issues going on. But what was said, and at that point, even though people had never met George Washington, Washington was gaining a lot of popularity in, in Paris. And a little bit later, you know, they really embraced Ben Franklin. And so, and maybe that was kind of the tip off to the upcoming French Revolution because they were getting fed up with the nobility having all the money and, you know, with, you know how everything was structured. Well, that was all part of the Enlightenment yeah. anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So, all, I think at all. Was it possible that his family also knew Jefferson from this? Um, <laughs> is it possible his family knew Jefferson uh, and or um, Madison from he, their years in France? And He knew Jefferson and Madison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there might be a predisposition. So there, Aside, yep. Wasn't he like extremely bright for his age and did sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, remarkable papers on finance and other issues that were um, sort of he, he was different and extraordinary for his age. Yeah, he was definitely intelligent. Mm -hmm. He absolutely grasped a lot of issues and. Yeah, even the political thing uh, being sent to Canada. You know, if he wasn't as astute and figured out what was going on, I'd say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go get, you know, Canada back to France. But, you know, he was able to do that. So I think he was intelligent. I, I don't know about the papers, but maybe it's true about the finance. I, I didn't really, and I don't remember reading anything in his memoirs. That, I mean, he was rich, he had money and had money coming in. Yeah, I think he was really well-educated. Yeah. Oh no, no, he was he was born in the better after she gave it. I think on the on the um, to your question on um, the French Revolution, didn't he advocate for a constitutional monarchy that yes. so that he's really straddling both sides? Right. So to be right. more like England, mm -hmm. um, even no, though yeah, it, it did, did you know catch up with him um, yep. and worked off of some of Jefferson's papers too. Yes, no, no, absolutely. He did that. And of course, the monarchy is saying no way. Um, you know, they, they wanted to keep the status quo, and he's trying to find a way to get in between. And, um, it's, you know, it's just you can't appease everybody. And that's sort of what happened with it. Just quick on, yeah. on War of 1812. Did he have any involvement in that? Did yeah. the Americans want him to come back? Yeah, I don't that was more think. naval anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, naval, they attacked, of course, right. Washington, Washington and up yeah. down here. And, um, yeah, he was not. Yeah, I think he was involved with the that French. Was, yeah, going on. Yeah. Any questions from out in uh, Zoom land? <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself if you do have a question, or you can drop it in the chat and I'll read it for you. Guess not. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, no, not yet. No, <laughs> nope, not yet. I have a couple folks on there. Hi, everybody. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> They're quiet, and that's They're okay. Quiet. They're that's quiet. Right. Yeah. I'll be around after it's over. If you'd like to look at the books, talk some more. Just sure. fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Okay, Amanda. Sounds great. I'm going to stop recording folks on. Oh, uh, Nancy has a question. Okay. In terms of research, did he have to be well known? To be a well known author, sorry, to be let in to libraries. Um, no, actually, I found libraries and uh, museums and historical libraries. Most of them are really helpful and like to share the information that they have in, in their facilities. Um, so no, usually if you identify yourself and go in and follow the rules, uh, most of them will 
be very, very helpful to you. When I did my book on Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, I, I did the majority of that at the National Park and the Research Library. And the, the head librarian who was one of the top researchers there was very helpful. He knew how I was looking for information and every once in a while I'd bring out a file and say, you forgot to ask for this. <laughs> and, and when he said, you've seen everything on Pickett's Charge we have, I knew I was pretty much. <laughs> so no, they, they're usually, willing to share and are happy to. She says, thanks. Sure. <laughs> cool, well, I can stop recording and then we can just be more casual and Very folks good. are welcome to hang around if you'd like. Thank you, yes. Yeah, thank you.